Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Sunday, so we're continuing with the, our character study on the famous character of Job. Um, if you did not see the, the first chapter I did last Sunday, it's uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you'll go back and watch that. And today we're going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with chapter 2. Uh, but before we get started in the study, I'd, I'd like for uh, Brother Bill and Brother Eric just to say hi and introduce themselves. Uh, go ahead, whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I'll go first, and yeah, yeah, I'm Bill, or, or the Panda Man Evangelist, and, you know, as ever, you know, my name actually means uh, exactly what I enjoy doing best, and that's actually evangelizing, and it's not just on the streets, because I like evangelizing on YouTube as well, on Facebook, and anywhere I can, but as ever, it's always a pleasure to be on Brother Luke's, Brother Luke's hang as well, so, you know, that's me, that's me. All right. I'm thankful that uh, Brother Bill can join me today. I hope uh, if you're watching the video here that you will subscribe to uh, Brother Bill's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and that we also have Brother Eric with us. You want to say hi? Hello. Uh, it's me, the homo. Uh, my, uh, my website is the homo. B E H A. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, every time you, you say the name of your channel, uh, it sounds like you're saying the homo, like you're the, you're the homo. And um, so oh. I want everybody to know that, you know, the name of your channel is the homo, B E H A L L M O. I don't know what uh, I don't know how you came up with that. Maybe this is a good opportunity to tell us how you came up with that name. And you are not the homo. You're the homo. Okay. Well, as we know, uh, Jesus Christ uh, is bringing the restoration of all things, and uh, we are taking back the word homo as of now. Okay. Back to you. <laughs> okay. All right. Please subscribe to uh, Brother Eric's YouTube channel, too. All right. So now I'm going to pick up uh, with uh, uh, the book of Job, uh, ch chapter um, 2. And we, I expect today we might get through chapter 2 and chapter 3. Uh, but in the first uh, the, the the first chapter, I, I laid a foundation for the book of Job. Uh, I was trying to establish uh, what time frame Job lived in and when the book of Job was, was book of Job was uh, was written. So uh, I hope you go back and watch that. I think that is uh, an important thing to consider. And also, I uh, talked about when uh, Satan appears, goes to, to to heaven and petitions God over over Job. How that all fits into into the scheme of things. Um, so first let me ask, um, since you guys didn't see what uh, I, I did last week on this, uh, do you have any opinions on to when you think Job fits in the, the chron chronology of the scriptures? Uh, whoever wants to go first, go ahead. Well, I think it's, it's, it would fit uh, in, in Genesis. So it was before, obviously, Exodus, Leviticus, and all that lot. So Job is quite, quite an early character and an early book. You know, that's that. That's how I see it. So I did, like I said, I'd even go as far as say, you know, that Job would would may have even been pre-flood. I can't prove that, but you know, <clears throat> some people would, would would say that, and others not. But very old book. Uh, and uh, Brother Bill, while, I, while you're there, let me ask you to, to comment on the the part we're going to discuss first uh, about Satan uh, going before God. And uh, I, I I tried to explain it in, in, in the best I could, but I'm not really confident if I really do even understand it. And, and that is that uh, this fall from heaven, uh, you've got... Uh, 
we know that uh, there's a war in heaven and Satan and a third of the angels uh, are cast out. And we also know that in Job, uh, Satan is has access to heaven and goes before uh, God and, and uh, accuses uh, Job. Uh, and, and we also know that uh, Satan is on earth at the time of Adam and Eve. So uh, do you have anything to explain to make any idea of how that all fits together? Well, I, only that it does. You know, that, 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 that we know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren as well. So although he's been cast out from heaven and, and, he, and he roams the earth, you know, to and fro along the earth, obviously there is there must some sort of dimensional thing here that he can still present himself to God and, and accuse the brethren as he did with Job. So, you know, whether that is God steps out of, of the third heaven, they say, his glory realm, into the second heaven and, and you know, Job can go there and accuse the brethren, I'm not 100% sure, but yeah, it's very, very mysterious, but all, all we know for sure is that, you know, he can still accuse the brethren for a while. You know, at, at that time is going to end shortly, I believe, but at the moment he can still do it. Okay, um, Brother Eric, do you have any opinions on this, uh, the, the time frame for the book of Job, and also this question about S Satan having access to, to God? Uh, well, I had in the past entertained a notion that it was possible that the, the land of UZ uh, was the land of the United States, but that's just crazy talk. And uh, <laughs> now, as far as uh, as far as uh, yes, we know it's the oldest book in the Bible. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, we see that um, uh, we we know there's a, an account of Satan being cast out of heaven, and then we also see that Satan does has access to heaven to God and, and he appears before God and to accuse Job. And we also know that I didn't mention to Bill, but there's an, also a case where Jesus said his his apostles just returned from the mission. And he, Jesus says to them, I, I saw Satan cast and, and his angels cast down from heaven. And so uh, you could take that to mean that he saw it in the distant past, or as some people believe, this, Jesus just saw it at that very moment. That was a, that was a thing that was happened right then. And then there's other people that believe that this scene about cast, being cast out of heaven is a future event in eschatology, and it's in the book of Revelation, and it, it, it's yet to come. So I don't know if you have any opinion on that. I've studied all the different viewpoints on it, but I, I can't really take a strong stand anyway. Right, Brother Luke. And... Uh, I'm in agreement with uh, Chuck Missler, who says some things are best left understood by physicists or small children. All right, Brother Bill, did you want to say anything else about that last thing I included about when Jesus said to his apostles, I saw uh, Satan fall, fall from heaven, uh, and uh, could that be taken as that? He 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 he's saying I just now saw him fall. So you got the, you know, I said you got the three scenarios as you rightly said the three schools of eschatology. One is he saw it in the future. One he saw it at that moment, and one he's talking back to a period of time when he actually saw it. So I, I'm on the old school in that sense that I think he was talking about a past event that had already occurred. You know. In probably about lots in, in in the times of Genesis. Personally, I said all three scenarios are interesting and they're all valid. But like I said, that's going to be one of them things we're going to have to ask the Lord when we get up there. There's yeah. still a lot of mystery, you know, you know, surrounding such things. <laughs> well, I I probably would lean towards the middle position that um, uh, Satan. Was, was cast out when Jesus said that it would happen at that very moment in time uh, because uh, it, because Jesus Jesus had 
basically defeated him because he had started his ministry and, and now Satan has no more uh, uh, that's that's why uh, Jesus said that uh, um, you have to first bind the strong man before you can uh, you, you know take go into his house and uh, do your do what you want in his house he has to be bound so there is a, a viewpoint that that's when Satan was bound and then of course other people say no he'll be fat bound for a thousand years during a millennial reign but I, I personally again I don't want to argue for any of these positions because I'm not that strongly convinced but I, I would lean towards the middle position all right unless you want to say anything else on that before we go on, we'll start with uh, the scriptures now okay uh, Job chapter 2 verse 1 I'll read it first in the KJV because I'm a KJV firstist. I, I always want to look at the KJV first, and then if necessary, I, I can look at another translation if it uh, if I feel it might be helpful. So it says again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now. I expounded on this same thing because uh, chapter 1, verse 1, starts the same way. And I expounded on this, and uh, people can go back and watch the first video and see my take on this. But I'd like for you guys to tell me uh, a few things about this verse. And, and, and that is, what are, who are the sons of God? And um, uh, first of all, go ahead, whoever wants to start. Yeah. Like I said, I'm old school again on that. You know, I, I believe that these sons of God, you know, were the were the angels. You know, they, they were the created angels. You know, and because they they came to present themselves with Satan, I believe they were specifically the the fallen angels. You know, in the first passage, but I've heard interesting stories. You know, just in that one verse, there's probably about twenty or thirty different interpretations. But I think that's 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 the take I take at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, brother Eric, any comment on who the sons of God are and what is a son of God? Well, brother Luke, uh, it's always uh, been uh, taught to me that uh, those were the. Uh, the created angels. Uh, whether they were fallen or not, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Now, we, we know that Jesus' title, one title for Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, and he's, he's uh, distinct and different than these, um, than in this verse when it says the sons of God, plural. Um, uh, so, uh, what what is how do you draw this distinction between the the Son of God and the sons of God, and then also not apply that towards angels, but also to you, the three of us who are c considered to be uh, sons of God, uh, children of God through the new birth, uh, uh, being born again as uh, Christians. Well, the distinction is the Son of God. Yeah, God is is a capital S, a big S. Uh, and the son of God, a saved person, is a small s. But also, it seems that you know a small s son of God it is a you know a, 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 an angelic creation as well. Okay, brother Eric. Well, brother Luke, I cannot speak for the angels, but I can speak for mankind and the spirit of adoption wherewith we cry, Abba, Father. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I made the point, and I, I'd like to get, normal, I don't like to repeat myself uh, since I've uh, already gone through this quite thoroughly in the first one, but I am interested in your opinion on this. So I'll, I'll, I'll go back into the subject a second time. And that is that um, I believe that before Bill and Eric and Luke were born again, that uh, we were not children of God. Now, it's a common belief, uh, and uh, very much in America, and I imagine around the world, that 
all human beings are children of God. But uh, I, I take the position, and I, th I think the scriptures tell us that you're only a child of God uh, when you get born again as a child of God through faith in Jesus. It's a, being a child of God is a spiritual status. We're spiritually become the children of God. But to be a child of God, you must come uh, be a, a, a direct creation of God. In other words, uh, Adam was uh, the son of God because he was uh, God made him directly. The angels are sons of God because they did not procreate. One angel did not, you know, cell divide into into two angels, and two angels didn't get together and and to, through sexual reproduction produce other angels. Every angel was a direct creation from God. So all direct creations from God are sons of God or children of God. And when we were born from our mother's womb, we were not children of God, we're not sons of God, because we were the result of procreation rather than the, than the result of direct creation. We are only results of direct creation in the new birth because the Holy Spirit it created us as a child of God through regeneration. Do you have uh, have you ever heard what I just said before, and do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, I've heard that, and that's that's the opinion I take as well. Because of sin and the you know the the fall, you know we, we were we were known as sons of Adam, no longer sons of God. And when we had to wait, obviously for Christ, so there could be you know sons of God again spiritually, you know new creatures. You know, so that comes in the word again, creature, creation. You know, so yeah, I agree with that statement. Eric, anything to say on that matter? Absolutely, Brother Luke, and uh, that sounds an awful lot like the gospel to me. The good news of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection that brings us to that state of being that we're discussing this at this time. Okay, so uh, these back to this verse, the sons of God. Um, we have two positions presented here that these are either uh, the fallen angels or the unfallen angels, or maybe all all of them collectively. Uh, there's another. Um, Theological position that I don't uh, I don't really like to get into that much, but I uh, I think it's worth mentioning at this time, and that is the subject of of the Nephilim, and there are people who believe that uh, when it talks about the the sons of God laid with the daughters of men, uh, some people believe that these sons of God were angelic beings who um, had some kind of sexual uh, intercourse with human women and produce some kind of hybrid offspring uh, and uh, then other people say no the sons of God are not angelic beings the, these are the the descendants of um, Seth so those are the two schools of thought on that uh, but uh, that, that's another reference to the, using the term sons of God Yeah, I was, I, was, I was just. I was yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure what the how to comment on that one, brother Luke. Uh, maybe Bill has some insight on that. Okay, is Bill still with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still here. Yeah, technical difficulties there. I'm all right now. Yeah, Mark. So I was going to say that I've heard both sides. You know, you got the sons of God being the Nephilim, and also the sons of Seth, they say. But if if these sons of God were, were children or descendants of Seth, that they would have been called the, the, the children of Adam or sons of Adam, not the sons of God. So that's why I, I probably err on the side that, that the sons of God were the fallen angels, and they did get up to some strange business. <laughs> okay. Um, all right then. I'll um, we'll, we'll move on with the uh, these verses. 
Uh, but I think that these were some foundational questions that I talked about last time that I was interested in your opinion on. So we'll move on now. Uh, again, it says, again, there was a day when the sons of God, and so we were concluding that these are uh, an angelic beings, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So we see that at this point, at the time of Job, uh, that, uh, that Satan had access to God, and he could present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. All right. Uh, I have a lot of questions about that verse, but let me just first get your just overall response to verse 2. This is this is why, you know, I, I believe, like I said earlier, when I said that he was already cast out, because he's saying that he's going to and fro, you know, in the earth, and walking, you know, up and down the earth. So we know that he's on the earth at this point of time, you know, when Job was around. Okay. Uh, brother, brother Eric, anything generally you want to say about the verse before I start asking some probing questions? I can't remember who it was. It might have been Paul that uh, also echoed uh, the same scripture where uh, Satan walketh about like a roaring lion, uh, seeking whom he may devour. Does anybody remember the, the reference uh, where that's referenced at in the New Testament? I can't tell you where it is. I'm familiar with it, though, and uh, so uh, uh, I, I think that Paul's saying, even even at his time, that Satan is uh, active on the earth, um, and that would argue against him being bound at this time. Um, Brother Bill, you want to comment and answer uh, Brother Eric's question, and then I, I've got some other questions of my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only, only that. You know that what he was describing was in one Peter five eight, where where, where the apostle Peter is, is telling us to be sober and vigilant. Oh, yeah. You know because our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion. You know walking about, seeing who he made us out you know, devour in that sense. So I'm just letting him know where that scripture is. All right, thanks. I I, I messed up thinking it was Paul, but it was Peter. Uh, Okay, my questions then are, uh, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And if, if God is omniscient and he knows everything, why does he have to ask Satan this question if God already knows the answer? The same reason is probing, the same reason he asked Adam and Eve in the garden, asking them where they were. And because they was hiding, because they was naked, God knew where they were, but it was proven, I suppose, for some reason. Yeah, that, that's the that's the same uh, the same example I gave in, in chapter one when the subject came up, brother Bill. That uh, uh, but but why does God ask these questions? These are rhetorical questions. God knows the answer already, and yet He asks the question. Is it, it? It shouldn't be taken that God does not know where Satan was or what Adam and Eve were doing. Brother Eric? Uh, yes, Brother Luke, I think I can finally answer that question. <laughs> now, if you knew everything, and you were full of joy, you would say the same thing. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, let's, I got see if I got some more questions about verse 2. And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. Okay, verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, uh, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. I'm... Uh, this, I, 
I think I might have uh, this is sounding awfully familiar to, to chapter one and I'm wondering if I did more than chapter one in the first study I don't think I did this is just it's kind of repeating it maybe we ought to look at chapter one and make sure that I have uh, let me look at that I think I think the reason that's familiar is because on another study we mentioned Job in that very same verse that was on a different study that's why it might be you know ringing in your ears uh-huh okay yeah okay sometimes uh, the, the, the stories are repeated and they're repeated uh, I think maybe for emphasis, well, just the same way Jesus says verily, verily, and uh, to emphasize that this is an important point. So they'll repeat it over and over again. Okay, um, so the verse 3, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause? Um, so first of all, um, uh, how is it possible that uh, the Lord could reference Job as a perfect and upright, upright man when the scriptures tell us that um, uh, no one is righteous, not, not even one? And uh, you know, we know that everyone falls short of the glory of God, and yet in this case, God refers to Job as a perfect and upright man. I suppose in a sense, not perfect as in sinless, you know, or, or never doing anything wrong, but perfect in the sense that Noah was. It was perfect in his generations, generations. So in comparison to, to the rest of, you know, fallen creation, you know, this Job, you know, had faith in God. And, and faith, you know, is so lacking then, as it was obviously in the, you know, the times of Noah as well. So that's what I think he's doing. He's, he's just making the, the point that this person is perfect in as much as in the generations and on the earth. You know, he has been found that he has faith and love for, you know, his creator God. So, yeah, certainly not perfect in the sense of he's sinless. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's the kind of answer I gave uh, on chapter one when this uh, this point was uh, I discussed it, uh, brother Eric. Uh, yes, brother Luke, I am reminded of a verse where the Lord is speaking and saying, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were uh, in this place. Yet he would not spare it because he was so upset at the. I can not remember the references. The, does anybody remember that that reference? But the a point is that God uh, singled out Noah, Daniel, and Job uh, uh, as a particular uh, group, whereas. Uh, A highly esteemed group. Uh, there's not much else mentioned about that, but one can infer that their particular, those three, had a, a certain relationship with the Lord uh, that may have foreshadowed uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know David uh, had a similar relationship uh, as well. Yeah, the, the, both the points that you made are, I made last week, and that uh, he could be calling him perfect and righteous in terms of that this is the best that, that mankind has to offer. He, 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 take Job. He's my example of the best. Um, and, or the other, of course, was the application Bill used is that uh, he, he is a man of faith, and I, I, I believe that uh, as far as dispensationalism, that there's never been a division in terms of uh, man being uh, uh, esteemed by God by his 
personal merit, but man is only esteemed by God and accepted by God through through his faith. So that because of Job's faith, and as as you said, uh, Noah and Daniel and many other great characters who are, uh, who are known for this great faith, that's why that uh, he's considered perfect and righteous. Uh, Brother Bill, any last word on that before we go on? No, no, you just bang on there. You know, that, that people have only, you know, perfect in the sense of the eyes of God through faith, always has been, always will be. You know, salvation and, and righteousness by, by faith, in, you know, in God. Simple as that. Okay. Um, um, it says, uh, uh, And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. So he's he's telling Satan. He said, even now, even though uh, I agreed to to let you go against him and, and harm him, uh, we know in the first chapter he he destroyed his uh, his uh, family, uh, and um, and yet even God says even now. Uh, he, his, he holds fast his integrity. So the first test of Job, uh, God's saying, he's passed this first test. And he, he, look what you've done, and he still holds fast his integrity, or I believe it could mean that he holds fast to his faith. Um, let me look at this in the Amplified here, uh, verse 3, and see if that would be helpful at all. Verse 3. Uh, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered and reflected on my servant Job? For there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God with reverence and abstains from and turns away from evil because he honors God. And still he maintains and holds tight, tightly to his integrity, although, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. That uh, really doesn't uh, add anything to my understanding. Okay, I'll, I'll go on to verse 4. Uh, it says, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me see. Verse, uh, yeah, verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Put forth but put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. All right, what are you going to do with that one? Well, Brother Lucas, this is a very sad time, and it's, it's just a, a very difficult time to job at this time. Brother Bill, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I on that? yeah, it's not, it's a self-explanatory, really, but God is making the point again. You know, the devil's saying, oh, well, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, because the devil's obviously been allowed to cause grief on his family, his loved ones, and everything else, but not him personally, physically. And God is just saying, yeah, well, he's, you know, I'm going to allow you to physically harm him, obviously not to kill him. And, and he'd obviously, you know, he's still going to be, you know, upright, and he's still going to have his faith, and he's still going to be, you know, keep his integrity there. You know, this is the confidence that, you know, God has... Because obviously at some point, Job has put faith in God, and, and God is, is the keeper of that. You know, once faith has been implanted in you, God's going to make sure that you're okay, and he's going to see you all the way through at the end. So, you know, God is making the point there that the faith or the integrity and the uprightness that, that Job has is from God anyway, so it can't be destroyed. You know, I think that's what's going on. You know, that's the undertones of what's going on. 
Well, it brings up two questions that I have. Uh, uh, one I'll, uh, is uh, the, your point about the faith being from God. Uh, uh, you know, the, a, a Calvinist would take Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 uh, as uh, the, the gift referenced would be faith. And um, I, I take it that the gift referenced in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is not faith, but the gift is salvation. And so, um, faith faith is a choice that a person uh, has to either put their faith or trust in, in Jesus or not. Uh, but if that is the case, then I know I know the answer. Or I know what you're, you know, we're in agreement on this. But um, if is it possible for someone who has faith in Jesus gets born again? And then they they could possibly lose their faith, uh, or is this faith going to be maintained because God maintains their faith and they can't lose their faith? Well, yeah, it's, yeah got the faith. You know, when we accept Christ by faith, you know, it, it's all is doing from that. You know, like I said, you know, we initially take because I believe God has given everyone a, a portion of faith. It says so in the scriptures. So it's a, it is a gift from God to every man, I believe, not to an elect or a select few. It's a gift that God has given to every single man that they can choose in that faith to accept Christ or not accept him, accept God or not accept him. But, you know, when the moment we accept him, it's almost like, you know, God kicks in. The rest is him now. And, you know, it doesn't. it's not our faithfulness that, that gets us to heaven. It, it's the faith that has been implanted. We took the initial step in as much as the gift of faith that was given to all men, we used that to choose Christ, to choose life. And, and, and you know, God in the, and Christ are you know, the man at his word. You know, believe it or not, that actually, what you just said there, ties into a memory verse that I've been memorising today, and that's Philippines 1 6. Is it all right if I quickly read that? And, and that's a lovely verse, and it says, being confident of this very thing, that he, right, which have begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So it's as almost, as soon as we've taken that initial faith, that's it. Christ is there and he's going to make sure, you know, he performs it. He makes sure, and we have a confidence in this, that he's going to see us all the way through. And I think that's the same what has happened to Job here. Obviously pre-Christ, but Job had faith in God, and God, as you know, is the faithful one, and he's going to make sure that, that Job sees all this through, and then Satan is, is utterly humiliated. Because Satan is 40, he was a anointed cherub, so, you know, assuming he's far superior as a, you know, fallen human being, and God is humiliating him through this whole thing, as we see it towards the end, that, that Job stays fast. Job holds his faith, despite all this, and God, like I said, destroys and humiliates Satan in this. But that's God's faith. It's his faithfulness that is implanted into Job and in every creature. It's not our own incentive. You know, we don't suddenly wake up and we have faith in God. You know, God, God draws all people. Okay. Um, I, I don't remember the very first time I read Job exactly. I don't know what day it was or year it was or, or something, but uh, but I, I do remember, and I think this is probably going to be universally true, any person who reads Job, it doesn't take long at all, only a few verses into the book, you're forced to ask yourself a question. And that is, why does God give Satan permission to harm Job? And you know that's the whole that that's the, the the point of the book, of course, is um, to um, um, answer that question. I mean, not not really. I shouldn't say to answer that question, but uh, that you, you, that question cannot be avoided throughout the book. Any person uh, logically has to ask themselves, why? Why would God do that? And uh, I answered the question in uh, last week. From my perspective, I'll ask Brother Eric first, uh, why does God allow Satan 
to torment Job in this way? What what purpose would there be in him allowing to, this to happen? Well, Brother Luke, uh, last time I tried to answer this question, I got in trouble. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Uh, all right, you don't want to risk getting in trouble again, I guess, so I'll have Brother Bill take a, a stab at it. Yeah, well, to answer this, because that's a very profound question, ain't simple, because there's a lot of things going on. You know, God is, A, humiliating Satan, all this, utterly. B, he's shown that faith that is implanted into a creature is more powerful than Satan. C, this is written for benefit of us and all future generations after reading this, you know, when we suffer these trials and tribulations, that, that we're not alone in that. That, that, that. that Job, a faithful servant of God, suffered, you know, for, 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 for his love for God and his faith towards God. So I think it was written for our benefit. If, if, if God didn't allow this to happen, one, like Satan wouldn't have been humiliated. Two, there'd be no way to prove that there is actually people with faith on the earth. And, and three, you know, that... that future generations would not have this assurance you know knowing that we can suffer and, and but within that suffering Christ is with us and it sees through all the way through all the way at the end so it's quite quite a lot of things going on just in you know within that context well it's not that my judgment is uh, you know perfect but in my judgment uh, your answer deserves five stars so I'll leave it at that. I wouldn't want to add anything to that. It was a great answer. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to the next verse then. <clears throat> uh, and the Lord, uh, okay. But see, so the Lord says, okay, you can hurt him physically as long as he, you don't kill him. And then verse 7 says, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he, meaning Job, took a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, man. man, it's really getting heavy now. Okay, what's your reaction to that, Saints? Well, out of all that, because you know, we know he's suffering boils and sores from head to toe, but the, the verse that sticks out to me most of all is, you know, his wife, you know, telling him to curse God and die. <laughs> you know, so there's a distinction between... A man of faith there and a woman without faith, you know, that always sticks out to me, that. More, more so than even the sores and boils on him, although that doesn't sound pleasant. Well, we, we know this is uh, not going to be the last time his wife is discouraging him instead of encouraging him in his faith. Uh, Brother Eric, your reaction to those verses? Well, uh, my wife says that to me all the time. <laughs> no, no, she doesn't. I'm kidding. Okay, a joke forgave her, and she went on to uh, mother uh, a whole bunch of new children uh, later on in the story. Huh. I can't remember if uh, if that's the case or not. Uh, if if and she does. <laughs> she she died. Died. He gets a new wife and new kids and family. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, she yeah, she dies. Oh, 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 oh. Um, I didn't want to say for sure that you're wrong on that, Eric, but I, I that was my thought too. But I'm going just from memory. And um, but I, I, the comment I made about uh, Job's wife last week was uh, I compared her to uh, you know Sarah. Uh, look what what did Sarah do? 
she helped to, to uh, give uh, Abraham doubts about the Lord's promises. You know, told him, "Hey, it's, well, I'm old, and he, you know, I know he promised us a, ch a child, but uh, I'm too old to go have a relations with my handmaiden Hagar." And uh, you know, she did that throughout, you know, repeatedly. And the same thing happened with uh, um, uh, rape Rebecca. Uh, when she was uh, uh, telling um, uh, Jacob to uh, scheme against his father. I mean, it seems like the, the, the women in the scriptures are just repeatedly, notoriously, uh, putting doubts and, and, uh, and, and making, making the men's faith difficult. And of course, we know what happened with Eve. <laughs> you know, she's the one that started it all, causing Adam to. I mean, Adam blamed it on her, but in a way, it was her fault because uh, she was the first one to believe Satan, and then and then uh, Adam followed suit. So it seemed like the women continue to stir up doubts and 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 lead men astray. And am I being too too? Uh, Broad and general now. Well, brother Nick, uh, I think you're right on. Uh, there's something going on here, and I want my lawyers to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> How about you, brother Bill? Do you dare say anything? Uh, is your wife close at hand right now, or do you have to restrain yourself? Yeah, she is close. She is close at hand. I'll be diplomatic and say that that women are certainly our weakness. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on then. Uh, she tells him, "Why don't you just curse God and die?" Uh, but I, I, let's talk a little bit before we move on about these sores. Uh, and he smote Job with sore boils. For from sole of his foot unto his crown. I mean, there's other times in the Bible where people have sores and boils and stuff, but uh, this is, I mean, it's from the sole of your feet. I mean, your whole body, from the bottoms of your feet to the top of your head, is covered with these painful, horribly painful boils, and then Job somehow is using something to try to scrape them, I, he, doing the best he can to try to, uh, you know, uh, Relief, get, get him some kind of relief from this horrible thing. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of bad things that can happen to people physically. Uh, this is this is certainly one of the worst things that I could imagine. All right, all right. Let's go on with uh, verse ten. But he said unto her, Job said to his wife, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. <laughs> what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Hmm. Verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was upon him, they came every one from his own place, uh, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. They lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. Well, first of all, if, let's go one verse at a time. Verse 10.
Should I call you guys by name or just let whoever talk wants to talk first go ahead? Okay. No, Brother Luke. Uh, Job's faith is awful encouraging. Uh, having not sinned with his lips the whole time, I know uh, I could not say that myself. Uh, thanks be to God and his son Jesus Christ. Uh, we have forgiveness of sins because uh, no, I never could have done what Job did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then verse 11 says, Now when Job's three friends heard this, uh, his friends are introduced, and their reaction is, when they saw Job, they wept. They rent every one of his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So their reaction was they were shocked when they saw his, his state. Well, yeah, because the key thing is there because it's sprinkled dust. You know, it's like, uh, you know, God oftentimes speaks, you know, about, you know, sackcloth and ashes. So it's, it's a sense of real genuine mourning, <laughs> you know, there. And, and, you know, also with an undertone that, that perhaps Job has done something really bad to God. And they need to, you know, in penance, you know, do do the sackcloth and ashes and, and, and mourn and, 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 and weep and wail like they did in them days. Obviously, we find out later on that, you know, they're completely way off the mark. But I think that was their initial reaction, yeah. Yeah. This um, reaction, we see this throughout the scriptures, a reaction of renting your clothes or tearing your clothes. Uh, one of the most dramatic examples was Caiaphas at the trial of Jesus when Jesus said that uh, he is the Son of God and that uh, they'll see him uh, in the end, uh, you know, sitting with the right hand of the Father, uh, that uh, Caiaphas rent his clothes. And uh, this reaction of tearing your clothes and then putting dirt on your head or ashes and that uh, I don't. We can. I don't know if that's just kind of like a natural emotional reaction, or if it's a standard procedure to uh, to to uh, visually demonstrate something. You, what do you think? Do you think it's just something that people naturally react? I've never been. I mean, I've been really upset in my life when I've gotten bad news sometimes, and I've never torn my clothes. Do you think that's uh, just something that uh, is, was common for people to uh, react that way, or was it something that there was symbolic that they did to express symbolically their uh, their feelings? Yeah, certainly symbolic. You know, it'd be interesting to try and look look into the history of that because I don't know much about it. But yeah, certainly symbolic because I ain't. You know, I've been upset quite often in my life, and I've not gone in the back garden and chucked a load of dirt on my head and ripped my clothes. You know. Probably in today's society they'll lock you up and put you in a mental home, but I've never felt inclined to, to do that anyway. But yeah, there must be some, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, from dust they were and dust they'll return. Perhaps there's a better symbolism of, of that sort of thing in there. Okay. Uh, I'll move on to... Uh Verse uh, 13, so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days uh, and uh, seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And joke, Job, wait a second. Oh, no, I, I went on to the third chapter there. Okay, so verse 13 says, For they saw his grief was very great. Um, I, uh, I personally have um, come to understand that, that uh, sometimes 
there's nothing that can be said. And uh, Scripture tells us that when, when someone's in grief, we should weep with them. It's, it would be inappropriate to even try to cheer them up. The, the only appropriate thing is to weep right along with them. Um, and these people, even though I think as we go along through the study, we're going to see that uh, um, they are, they're, you know, they're, quote, friends of Job, but they're really not helping him out with their uh, fault finding, with, with their, they're doing and finger pointing, but they're, uh, uh, they do this one thing right, in my opinion, in this, this verse here, is that they don't say anything for seven days. His grief is so great, they don't even say a word because, there are certain times it's, it's, it's not even appropriate to try to cheer someone up and try to put a positive light on things. You're better off just being silent or weeping with them. Do you, do you think that, uh, uh, I, I think they've done the right thing in that case. What do you think? Yeah, yeah I would say I agree, yeah. I have put on a side, if you even look in the chat section, of uh, where sackcloth and ashes, you know, what, what it means. And it's probably pretty similar to what I, I was thinking anyway. Um, do you want me to read it? It would be helpful to read it. Yeah, yeah, read, read it, read it. Okay, it says sackcloth and ashes were used in Old Testament times as a symbol of debasement, mourning, and or repentance. Someone wanting to show his repentance Repentant heart would often wear sackcloth, sit in ashes, and put ashes on top of his head. Sackcloth was a coarse material, usually made of black goat's hair, making it quite uncomfortable to wear. The ashes signified desolation and ruin. Yeah, okay, so that uh, that is, uh, uh, I don't know where you've got that source source that information, but uh, that goes along with what we were saying, but what do you think of the idea of sackcloth being coarse material and it's going to be uncomfortable? It seems to me it's almost like the, uh, what is it, when they beat themselves? Um, what's that called? Well, flagellate, flagellate. Yeah, it seems almost like the practice of flagellation. Uh, yeah. I don't know, not quite as bad as flagellate, yeah, but the thing is, as you say, symbolic, where, where they see someone suffering, and there's suffering going on, I think they tried to, in genuine love and compassion, to have a sense of empathy. So they put, deliberately put on coarse, itchy, horrible goat's hair so they can, I suppose, have an empathy towards them, so they can feel like they're contributing somehow by, by suffering in, to some degree or not. Obviously not in a perverse Roman Catholic flagellating stuff like that, but you know you can understand the the mentality and the empathy behind, you know, what they're doing. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's ver chapter two. We'll move on to chapter three, unless you guys have anything, uh, final comments before we move on. Okay, chapter three says, After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of months. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come therein. Uh, let them curse it, that curse, let them curse it, that curse the day, who are ready to raise up their mourning. Uh, that's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Uh, let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it be let it look for light, but none but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day, because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. Why died I not from the womb? 
Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did the knees prevent me? Or why the breast that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest. With kings and counselors of the earth, which build desolate places for themselves, or with the princes that had gold, who filled their houses with silver, or as a hidden untimely birth I had not been, as infants which never saw the light. Where there the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto, his bitter, unto the bitter in soul, uh, which long for death, but it cometh not, and dig for it for uh, more than hid treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave, why is light given to man whose way is hid and whom God hath hedged in? For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roaring are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid is come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Well, I didn't expect to read the entire chapter and one thing, but it all was his his um, statement when he finally spoke after seven days. This is what he had to say, and I think it's all he's all saying really the same thing in a uh, you know, very dramatic fashion. So, what basically, in your own words, is Job's expressing? He's lamenting. As simple as that. He's lamenting over. You know, everything that has occurred. You know, that was his kind of his escape, wasn't it? He was so on and had it, you know, kept to himself and to the point not like seven days later, he suddenly exploded and he just had to let it out and tell his friends and just to let him know how you know how, you know, how much he's mourning. Yeah. Um, is is he saying? that he wishes he had never been born. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he wishes, yeah. 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 Because I, I suppose you would, wouldn't you? You know, you, your family gets wiped out, you lose everything that you've ever worked for and owned. And then obviously you've got sores from head to toe. You know, you would. I suppose you would. <laughs> I wish I was never born. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, uh, all right, uh, it seems I, I mean, he really, I mean, you talk about saying, he, he could have just said, I wish I'd never been born, but that's, that's really what that whole chapter is, is saying, that he, he is suffering so much that it would be better if he had never been born, if he had been stillborn in his mother's womb. Uh, and yet, I mean, some people react to that in a way where they say that, uh, you see, Job, Job lost his faith or Job, you know, uh, uh, Job failed. And do you see this as a failure in the story of Job? No, I, I see this as a fallible human suffering. And so does God. You know, we, we, we know the end of the story, so you know, we know God's reaction to all this at the end, but you know, that's what he is, he's suffering, you know. You know, it, it even says, you know, there's a there's a time for you know, life and death, there's a time for war and peace, there's a time for all these things. And obviously the time at the moment is you know, Job is mortal and rightfully so. Yeah. Um, I, I want to make this personal for me in a minute, but first I, I want to give Eric a chance to comment on that, this chapter three. 
Well, Brother Luke, in my opinion, he's uh, doing something very familiar to myself, which I do constantly all the time, which is to cast my cares upon him because he cares for me. And now Job still had his faith in God, and he still knew that God cared for him. And he's just casting his cares upon God. He's just being honest with God. You know, they, there's been a, a debate about uh, how to treat uh, prisoners uh, when you want information. Is it, are you justified in torturing someone? And uh, they, they, they say that every single person under torture will break. Everybody has a breaking point. No one can uh, completely make. That's why it was common to give people a cyanide capsule to take, so that, because they knew that every person will break once the torture is long enough and severe enough, and and they'll talk. So they were given a cyanide capsule so they kill themselves and not and not be in a position where they have to talk and divulge secrets. Uh, so everybody breaks if the suffering is enough. Um, and uh, so I think that's what's happening here with Job. He, he's, he's, he's breaking under such severe suffering. And yet, those of us who read the whole book in the past, we know that th this isn't close to the end of the suffering. And I, um, I don't want to, you know, um, even begin to compare myself to Job, but we were talking about uh, the benefit of this book, the the reason for the book, the reason that God would even permit this to happen, and and uh, the and, and 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 Bill cited one of his three reasons was to me the, the the primary reason, and that is to inspire all of us and give us perspective. Uh, and this last year was the hardest year of my life, and 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 it seemed like you know I had to have back surgery and it didn't go the well way it was supposed to and I had to have another surgery and then I had to have another surgery and then I had this complication and that complication and it went on for many months and every week I got more bad news and more bad news and it's just like uh, it, it, it's the I, I just almost re I reached the point where I thought Every week I'm going to get more bad news, another complication, another thing to deal with. And of course, uh, my, my suffering uh, didn't rise to the level of Job by any means. And yet I understood, that I can understand and relate to a certain extent how look what's bad has happened. Now he, he first he loses his family, and now he's suffering horribly physically with these boils. Uh, and uh, he doesn't even realize at this time that it's going to continue. It's, it's, he wishes he was dead. There, at a certain point, if a person suffers enough, they will say, I, I, I'd rather never been born than have to go through this. All right, well, I'm going to move on to Chapter 4 in a minute, but before, before I do, just anything else you want to say about this before we can move on? Self-explanatory. Okay. Well, I, I guess I would. It is worth asking the question since uh, I uh, I related I related my own uh, case where um, and, and again I, I think probably everybody uh, Job's case what I went through last year. It, it, there are not just a few unique individuals that go through life and have a lot of suffering. Every person is going to have some suffering. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if you guys have anything that you could say that you can relate to this because you had a time of suffering and you, you, under, you got some perspective from Job and, and yet you've ever felt like this. Have you ever felt like... Job felt feels at this point. Yes. 
Eric? Absolutely. Eric, Absolutely. Yes, I agree. And uh, I stand with Job when Job said, even if God slays me, yet will I trust him. And that's the benchmark of my faith, and that's where I stand, and that's where Job stood. All right, let's move on now. Um, chapter uh, chapter 4. Let me see. Bill, if you want to post that in the chat section, maybe it would be helpful, but I'm going to look it up. Uh, I've done it already, yeah. It's already in there. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Chapter 4 says, Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If we assay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees, but now it is come upon thee, and thou faintest, it touches thee, and thou art troubled. Well, I think that's a point to stop there. Uh, so what's your take on the big, these first five verses? That sounds a lot like what Jesus did for me. How his word has upholding him that was fallen. Thy words have upholding him that was fallen. Okay. I'm still I'm stuck looking at it to get get some context on it. Let me read it in the amplified here real quick. Uh, maybe that would. It says, uh, then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, "If we dare to converse with you, will you be impatient or offended? But who can restrain himself from speaking? Behold, you have admonished and instructed many, and you have strengthened the." Weak hands, your words have helped the one who was stumbling to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees. But now adversity comes upon you, and you are impatient and intolerant. It touches you, and you are horrified. Hmm. Yeah, so basically Eliphaz isn't really being uh, the most sympathetic chap there. You know, because obviously at times, Jovers give people friendly and helpful advice and help people in that suffering. And, and out now he's suffering. You know, Eliphaz, you know, is, is assuming that Job is being a hypocrite. You know, he's not being a, acting how he'd advise someone to act. So, you know, that that is what's going on there. But, yeah, he's not obviously a, he's not a confidence builder as Eliphaz. <laughs> And you know, he obviously we, we find out later again that, that all his friends completely misjudged poor old Job anyway. But you know that that's that, that's what's going on at the moment. Yeah, they don't they don't talk for seven days, and then Job lets it all out. He's just he's just crushed dealing with such suffering, and he lets it all out, and he shows weakness. Because anybody would, as as I said earlier, everybody has a breaking point when it comes to suffering, and Job is is just broken at this point, and he's saying, "I wish I was dead." And, you know, I should have never been born, and rather than go through this kind of suffering, and instead of his so-called friends continuing to keep their mouth shut, it would have been better if they kept their mouth shut for another seven days, but instead. What he says is uh, challenging Job's uh, uh, saying that 
look, when other people had difficulties, you were there and counseled them, encouraged them, and strengthened them and stuff. And yet, look, you're weak. You, you're, you're falling all apart. <laughs> we're we're going to find out as we go along. If you, With friends like that, you don't need enemies. Brother Eric? Well, Brother, Brother Luke, I admire that they stuck with him for seven days without saying nothing. That would, I, I probably wouldn't have lasted five minutes. Yeah, I, as I said earlier, and the, the certain times when you have a friend or family member that is grieving, um, I've had many times where I didn't know what to say, and, and uh, later on, years later, I realized that's that's the best thing. Don't say anything. There are some times where people don't want to hear positive things. They're, what they're going through is so hard, they don't want to hear. Have a positive attitude. Have have faith. Just you know, and, and try to try to give them some kind of positive perspective. When really bad things happen, that's not really what people want to hear or need to hear. What they really need is you should we should just weep along with them or remain silent. Um, but when he his friend chose to speak, he, he did not say um, what uh, you know I think is appropriate. Uh, so let's go now to uh, um, I'll read this and Go back to this uh, KJV, verse 6. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, the, and the uprightness of thy ways? Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent. Ooh. Or where were the righteous cut off? <laughs> Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and so wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of the, his nostrils they are consumed. Well, um, we'll go on, uh, but to, we can stop here too because the, the point is being made. Uh, what is the point that he's trying to, to make right now to Job? Well, the point, like I said, he's got it all, all back the front. <laughs> you know, he thinks that Job is suffering because of sin or unrighteousness. So, you know, this is way off the mark. And obviously, certainly, uh, very lacking in the sympathy. <laughs> but, yeah, he's way off the mark because the assumption, and, he, and even in Jesus' time, there was an assumption that, that if someone... Something bad befell upon someone that, that it was due a sin or a past sin, you know. Because even often, you know, that, that they said, you know, what a sin, this sin, what, what a sin has this person done to make him ill? You know, and Jesus basically said, you know, he has no sin in that sense, you know. But he, he was, you know, made that way in the, so that Christ could be glorified. Very similar, believe it or not, to what has happened to Job at the moment, you know, that 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 that. that, that Job never done any particular sin that brought this punishment. You know, in actual fact, it's the opposite. It was allowed so that God could be glorified throughout all this. And also, to show, you know, it's for God's glory. Well, we know that there, uh, there is a law that applies to believers and unbelievers alike. Uh, the law of reaping and sowing. Um, uh, and we also know that there's a another, I don't know if I can call it a law, but, a, but a, a doctrine that applies to believers, and that is the doctrine of chastisement from God. Um, but should we assume that every time something bad happens to somebody, that it, it is either a consequence of reaping and sowing, as he's being accused of here, that you must have done something bad, that's why this is happening to you. Uh, or um, that uh, even more specifically, that uh, God is chastising you. Uh, should we assume that? Or, or is, is there room to, to believe that, that sometimes bad things happen and, and, and God is uh, not 
the author of it, he's not trying to chastise and correct you as a child of God, and that and it, it's happened to you and, and be through no fault of your own. You didn't go, uh, you know, uh, st start taking drugs and become a drug addict, and then and then your health and life is ruined. It, it wasn't a consequence of your bad behavior at all, but you you just merely were minding your own business, and and uh, all of a sudden a tree fell on top of your house and you were killed. You know, that, that's, things like that happen. So how does all of this, is, is there, there room for this third possibility? Oh, yeah. Well, there is, yeah. Like I said, yeah, we had the rape and the sun and the chastisement and stuff like that. But then you just have the element of, you know, things like this just happen. You know, it's that bit in the Bible, isn't there, where that, I can't remember his name, where, where the uh, uh, Israeli, you know, Jewish general was going up in the building, and a lump of building fell. You can remember that a lump of building fell on him and crushed him completely flat. <laughs> he didn't do anything wrong, it just happened, you know. <laughs> and then that, things like this happen in life. You know, and you, we have to be careful, and I think that's another good reason that, that Job is written, because that we will find out later all this happened not because of something Job done wrong. It just happened, you know. You know there was a test. Obviously, we know the whole story that that, that Job was being tested and it was for God's glory. But we have to be careful. And this is what's written, you know, not to assume that anyone who's got some illness or disease or something wrong with them is that they're evil and God's punishing them. Because you get you get a lot of that even nowadays, don't you? In so-called Christendom, you know, someone gets cancer. You know, and you get some like West Bro Baptist Church and say, "Well, God's punishing you because, you know, you done this or you done that." Well, where it's nonsense, you know. So we have to be careful, and I think again, this is why God allowed this to happen, and this why this book is in here because that just shows you the element of no Job never done anything wrong, but this happened to Job. Yeah, I was going to ask you, but you already um, introduced the subject. Uh, it's kind of like the Word of Faith movement, or the Name It and Claim It people, or uh, the 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 uh, the the faith healing. That uh, I mean, I I've had times where people said to me uh, that my health problems were because of one of two things: either uh, there's some sin in your life, uh, or there's some lack of faith because, you know, uh, I'm praying for you and other people are praying for you and you're praying and, and yet you're not healed. So it must mean that, that you don't, uh, you're, you, you don't have enough faith. Otherwise you'd be healed. And there's a, that's a, a thing that you've made a lot of videos about already, Brother Bill, this, uh, I, I guess the word of faith or is there some other category you put it under? But these are the people that are, want to say that when bad things are happening to you, it's either because of sin in your life or your lack of faith. Yeah, yeah it is. They're all linked, yeah, that the word of faith, the name it and claim it. And, and you know, the, these people, you know, the hot, I like to call them charismaniacs because you get hyper charismaniacs and every single thing that happens in life is for spiritual reasons. Things don't just happen just because. You know, and that's nonsensical. You know, it always make you laugh. You know, <laughs> you know these people say, well, you know, if if you named it and claimed it, and you had enough faith, you'll be cured of this, cured of that. You know, if that was true and that was the case, no one would ever die, would they? Because they'd name it and claim, oh, I claim another ten years, Lord. Oh, okay. And they'd live for a thousand years, wouldn't they? It's, it's nonsensical. This <laughs> this business. Things just happen just because, and it's simple as that. And I think the only thing that we can draw out of that is in spite and in despite of you know things happening that, that we still keep close and cling close to, to Christ and, and just you know reminded of ourselves you know how much he suffered how much Job has suffered and how much all the apostles suffered you know but we're not, we're not promised the rose garden as Christian are we you know we're promised that the, the love of Christ will abide with us forever and eternal life that's what we're actually promised but not not a rose garden, not not a rich life, not a completely healthy life or anything. So yeah, you know I think that's important. Yeah, not only not only that, 
But uh, when we do suffer, as jo Job did, uh, he, 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 we have an opportunity to um, uh, our our reaction to suffering is a testimony to others because people are watching us, and uh, I've often I've often thought about uh, I even made a video about what kind of death do you desire? I mean, would it be better to go to sleep tonight and die peacefully in my sleep? Uh, uh, there wouldn't be any suffering involved, or or would it be better? And I don't desire it, but would it be better to uh, die over the period of months or years suffering from an illness? And and, and it's during that time of suffering, um, have the opportunity as other people observe. Observe, observe us and interact with us during that time, they will witness our faith. And it, 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 it could be a great testimony of our faith if, we, if our faith does endure during that suffering. So, you know, I've struggled with that a little bit because on one hand, I'd like to have a, the easy way out. <clears throat> on the other hand, I see the... Uh, being able to testify about Jesus and praise Jesus even when there's suffering going on, uh, that's really what made the church boom in the first century, is that people were singing hymns and praising Jesus as they're being eaten by lions and as they're being burned alive. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me look at that. I'm going to read it one more time in the uh, Amplified. Uh, all right, did I re did I read this in the Amplified? These verses here or not? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's let's go then to the. Uh, uh, what verse am I on? The uh, uh, ten? No, nine. Do you remember where I left off? No, it was. Uh, did it finish on nine? Did you? I can't remember now. All right, I'll just start. I'll start with nine here. It says, "By the blast of God they perish, and the, by the breath of His nostrils are they consumed. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken." The old lion perisheth for lack of prey, uh, and, the la and the stout lion's whelps are scattered abroad. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard, uh, and I heard a voice saying, "Shall mortal man be more just than God?" Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation in, is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from the morning to evening, they perish forever without any regarding it. Doth not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. Personally, I'm going to need to read it in the Amplified to make sense out of that, but I'd like to hear, if you, have some, if you can explain that to me, go ahead. Well, all I can briefly say is that 
Eliphaz isn't really like uh, Barnabas. He's not really an encourager, is he? <laughs> he's not. He's not encouraging poor old Job and all this. But yeah, read it in the Amplified. <laughs> Okay. In the Amplified, verse starting with verse 10, the roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. Now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it. Amid disquiet, quote, I don't know, it says, amid disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, dread and trembling came upon me, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair on my skin stood on end. The spirit stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence, and then I heard a voice saying, Can mortal man be just before God, or be more righteous than he? Can a man be pure? Uh, before his maker or be more cleansed than he but uh, God puts no trust or confidence even in his heavenly s servants and he charges his angels with error how much more will he blame and charge those who dwell in houses bodies of clay whose foundations are in the dust who are crushed like a moth between morning and evening they are broken in pieces and destroyed unobserved and unnoticed they perish forever is not their tent cord drawn up within them so that the tent collapses? Do they not die and yet without acquiring wisdom? Hmm. Well, it's more comprehensible than the King James Version, certainly, but the point he's driving is, is basic. And what do you think his main point is again with Job? Well, again, his point is... He's just assuming wrongfully that, that God is destroying and causing all this calamity upon Job's life because Job has erred or has sinned greatly somewhere. You know, so, and, and obviously, Eliphaz is saying that God is right and just to punish you and cause this to happen to you because of your sin and because of that. So, yeah, Eliphaz is missing, missing, completely missing the whole point. You know, being a very much a discourager in the whole thing. We're supposed to encourage one another. <laughs> it's uh, he's uh, he didn't talk for seven days, and then when he finally talks, is uh, he doesn't even attempt to be positive and encourage. He's he's just saying, Job, you're getting exactly what you deserve. Yeah, yeah. I mean, better off if Job just kept his mouth shut and lived in a cave for a month, really. Yeah. All right, I'll go on to the next chapter unless Eric wants to add to the be, say anything before we move on. Uh, well, Brother Luke, I would just like to add that uh, in verse 19, it uh, emphasizes how we can't not please God in these mortal bodies, and we need something more, and that something more is Jesus Christ. It's uh, he he's uh, he seems to, in one hand to be very knowledgeable and wise, and he even quotes a spirit that told him spoke to him, and and so you'd think that what he's saying must be true, but uh, so it's 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 like so many things that we get. There's a mixture of truth rolled up into something that's wrong. He's he's. Uh, saying some things like, "Oh yes, we're just mortal, and uh, and God's greater than us. And if God says the angels have done wrong, then of course you know, then we have to understand that we're we're just mortals, and we're going to die. And and so all this stuff, things he's saying are true, except his conclusion that you, you get what you're getting, what you deserve is uh, isn't it interesting how so many false things are mixed up with some truth and so it, people can be easily uh, misled well, yeah I was just going to say that he obviously hasn't got the gift of discerning spirits there has he, he really, <laughs> you know and, and that's a, that was a problem in the New Testament as well because Paul had to write it in, in the Corinthians didn't he you know it's a spiritual gift and it is you know that the we we can discern 
you know, the, the, the spirits, but you know, obviously they, Eddie Fares didn't really get it here, did he? That, that, I don't think that was a spirit of, the spirit of God, put it that way. All right, so let me read this now. Let me see, we're uh, Job 5. Um, so at this point, Job not only is suffering physically, but he's so suffering psychologically and emotionally with his so-called friend uh, telling him, hey, you're just getting what you deserve. Job 5, verse 1, Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? Oh, God. Is he a Roman Catholic on top of everything else? Um, For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. I, I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. His children are, are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them. Uh, whose, whose harvest the hungry eateth up, and taketh it even out of the thorns, and the robber swalloweth up their substance. Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. Uh, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth waters upon the fields to set upon, uh, set up on high those that be low, that those which mourn may be exalted to safety. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. Well, this is still his friend going on and on, just pouring more and more uh, uh, poison on on Job, huh? Yeah, yeah, same thing again, yeah. Just not being very helpful there at all, really. And, and now he's also, yeah, the new twist on his unhelpfulness is, is the assumption and reading between the lines of what he's saying here you know his friends assume and that Job hasn't brought a petition to the Lord and, and Job hasn't spent seven days asking God what was going on you know so his friends presume and you know you have none of this why don't you actually go to God why don't you ask him to help you why don't you do it you know so yeah a lot of, a lot of unkind assumptions in there mm -hmm. uh they meet with darkness in the daytime and grope in the noonday as in the night. But he saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor hath hope and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands... Uh, make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven there shall be shall no evil touch thee. Uh, in famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in a war from the power of the sword. Uh, thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth, for thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee, and thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt not sin. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great, and thine offspring as the grass of the earth, thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a shock uh, of corn cometh out in his season. Lo this, we have searched it, so it is, hear it, and know thou it is 
know thou it for thy good. Well, one thing that stands out to me in this long um, um, rebuking that, uh, what's his name again? Tell something, Telmuth or something. What's the name of his friend? You had remember? Yes, brother, that's Eliphaz the Kenamite. Okay, Eliphaz, okay. Uh, Eliphaz is going on now for two chapters just rebuking uh, Job. And uh, I'm not going to go into a, 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 a long uh, talk about uh, the book of James and how I see it. But uh, I, I think that the, the similar point I've made in the past in that um, there are examples in the scriptures where we read the scriptures and what we've been reading for the last two chapters are the words of Telephaz, right? I know, Af, Af, what's the name again? Eliphaz. Eliphaz. We're reading the words of Eliphaz. And it's in the Bible. But does that mean that everything we read in the Bible is truth? No, sometimes, and, and, and another example would be the Sadducees. The Sadducees are in the Bible, and their teaching is in the Bible, and yet Jesus says it's false, that they teach there's no resurrection. So just because we read something in the Bible, it doesn't mean that that particular thing in the Bible is from God and true. These are the words of Telephat or Aphala, whatever his name is, Eliphaz. And the words of Eliphaz, even though it's in the Bible, it's not the words of God. Um, but and yet it sounds so wise. It's so eloquent. And so it'd be very easy for people to read the words of Eliphaz or the words of a Sadducee or the words of some of the things that are in James that I think are incorrect, that are later corrected by Paul and Peter and the others, saying that, hey, this Judaism that we had in the beginning of the church has to be left behind, and we can't continue mixing Judaism with, with uh, Christ. And here... So we see some things in the scriptures that sound good, and, and we think, well, we want to adopt it. But this is not to be adopted, uh, even though Eliphaz is eloquent. Uh, I hope I made my point. I don't know if I we did very well, but what do you think of that? Well, yeah, like I said, we, we know, you know, regardless of scriptures, that, that all of the scriptures written for us, but it's not all written to us. So, you know, the scripture, like Eliphaz quoting here, it's written for us so we can understand, and we like to get the whole picture at the end of Job, but it's not written to us, because Eliphaz is way off mark, completely so far off mark, it's embarrassing. <laughs> you know, because we find out at the end of Job. But what, one key thing that picked up for me, which ties into that, is it the key verse is verse 17. And it says, Behold, happy is the man whom God hath corrected. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. So, you know, he's way off my, you know, way off line there. Still under the assumption that, you know, this is all happening and he's supposed to be happy that this is happening because he's getting chastened by God. But he's not getting chastened by God. And like I said, there is, as you say, there's elements of truth in that, that, yeah, God can chasten and does chasten those he loves, but he's not chastening Job. So, and, and the same as what he's making, you know, the point in James. There's a lot of truth in there, but there's also a lot in there that, um, you know, that, that wasn't written to us. A, a is Gentiles and B, you know, in, in the, you know, in, in the, the grace age. So, yeah, you know, the Bible's written for us but not every single part of it is true as, you know, and, and the same with Job here. <clears throat> the wisdom, you know, there is wisdom in what Eliphaz is saying, but it is way off mark, and, and, and 
the accusations and the chasing and everything else that do not belong, you know, on Job's lap. Um, all right, let me just look ahead very quickly here and see that the next one is chapter uh, six. These last few chapters we have gone through very quickly because it's 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 uh, just a long tirade by Aphala or Aphaleth or whatever. <laughs> I can't remember who I have. I'm stuck on his name. I can't get it. But think of an elephant and put what? as at, Think of an elephant and put as at the end. Elephant. <laughs> Oh yeah, elephant, but it's elephant. Okay. Elephant, yeah. Very good, thanks. And now in verse in chapter six, Job answers. Okay, so we'll get into that next time. I want to have time left for the uh, invitation, so um, I guess it's a good place to to stop. Um, be before we close and have the invitation for salvation. Uh, let me just ask each of you to kind of recap the study today as far as anything that really stood out stood out to you. Well, what stood out to me is obviously Job's sufferings and, and the calamity that was you know poured upon him. You know were, were for, for God's glory, Satan's humiliation, and the Eliphaz was way off the mark. You know, all these accusations are way off mark. You know, that that's what's really stood out. But you know, I have really seen, you know, at the beginning portion, you know, a real sense that that I really haven't thought much of, but for some reason today I, I dwelled on it within my mind is Satan's humiliation. You know, I've not really seen that before until today, you know, in, in such deep terms. And and you know, when we read when you read the first you know, chat we read today in the first few verses, you know, that I could really see that, you know, that, you know, that, that the devil is allowed to do all these things, all this suffering, just on a mere mortal, you know, a, a fallen human being, sinful fallen human being, and this is being done by an anointed cherub, you know, someone who wanted to exalt himself above God, someone who wanted to become God, and, and God is humiliating and destroying him, for a weak mortal man, I think that's excellent. Yeah, I I really um, I'm glad you uh, introduced that as a a benefit of the book because uh, I, I hadn't really even considered that before. That uh, uh, but we we do know that uh, uh, the the other two points that you mentioned besides. The humiliation of Satan. You mentioned that the uh, this shows that a per, it is possible for a person to keep their faith uh, even while suffering greatly. Uh, some people do lose their faith. If, if they if they have faith in Jesus for salvation, then even if they lose their faith, then Jesus remains faithful anyway. Uh, but then there are some people that don't lose their faith. Uh, when tragedy comes their way, and uh, I, I'm sure that some people do lose their faith, but thankfully, Jesus is, remains faithful to us. Uh, and then, of course, the third reason is the primary reason I thought that the book was uh, this book is here for us, and these these events happened, and that's for our, our inspiration and perspective, because everybody is, has to go through their job. Uh, 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 difficulties, you know, I'm, maybe not to the level of Job. I think there's some people that maybe suffered more than Job. I mean, there's there's certainly a lot of people throughout history. Job did not suffer to death, but look at all the Christians who were martyred and suffered horribly through through the Inquisition and the uh, uh, the, the horrible periods of persecution throughout church history. Uh, and yet, um, many of these people remain faithful. But so, I think every person um, is going to have some suffering in their life. Uh, there's there's a, a lucky few that their suffering is less, but everybody has to have some kind of suffering. And and this gives us a perspective, so that uh, we can say, hey, uh, think of remember Job, uh, brother brother Eric. What's your uh, 
summary of the study for today, and then we'll have uh, Bill do an invitation. Well, Brother Luke, um, what was already said by Bill and yourself pretty much covered it all, and uh, I'd rather uh, not uh, disturb what has already been uh, laid down in that respect. So you're you're saying amen to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the, we can learn a lot, as as Brother Bill said. Uh, all scripture is for our learning, and even the parts that to me are kind of like boring and tedious, like reading through genealogies. There, there's something to even be learned from that. We can learn from everything in the Word of God. Um, but uh, uh, not all of this pertains to our salvation, and. and and yet, what's more important? There is nothing more important from the time we're born to the time we die. That there's nothing more important than us receiving the gift of eternal life. Um, and we've really failed everybody if if we discuss the Bible and theology and you know all the different fascinating subjects of theology, and yet we neglect the one thing that is uttermost important, and that is. Uh, what do you have to do so you get to go to heaven after you die? So we we will not neglect that, and we want to end every broadcast on that subject. So Brother Bill, if someone's watching right now and and uh, they don't know the answer, they, if we ask ask them, do you do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? As you know. The, the, uh, if we ask that to everybody in the world, a, a, a tiny percent of the people will answer the question correctly. Almost everybody in the world will answer the question, well, am I going to go to heaven? I, I think so. I hope so. I might. Um, and, and, and the reason I, I think I might go to heaven is because I've tried to be a good person. And, and I think I've been good enough that God will accept me. That is the universal answer. That is what almost everybody's belief system in the world is based upon the merit system, personal merit. And yet we know that's wrong. That's not what the Bible tells us. Uh, that's not the way to get into heaven. So Brother Bill, I want you to answer that question. Uh, do, you, do you believe that you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Yep, I believe I'm going to heaven. Not based on me. Not bare, like I said, nothing meritorious in what I have ever done or could ever done. It's all based on, on, on Christ, you know, it's grace, which is, un, un, you know, unearned favour. You know, it's something that, that Christ has given for us that we couldn't earn, we couldn't buy. It's totally unmerited. And, and that's, you know, in confidence, because I know Christ, he knows me, that, that I know I'm going to heaven. You know, I, I'm not going to, which so many people do, they err, and they call God a liar, even in innocence and ignorance, assuming that, that, that they could believe on this Jesus fully and totally and not go to heaven, you know, thinking somehow that they have to contribute, they have to do something to earn God's favour to get to heaven. And, and that is, like I said, that's the quickest way, and that is what, unfortunately, is going to send, you know, most people to hell. Because they believe they ha it's a that they have to earn salvation, you know. As if God, you know, I do this for God, and He do this for me. That's not how salvation works. That's not how grace works, you know. If, if that's how it worked, then, then then Christ died in vain, you know. He came to earth and He died, you know, shed His precious blood, you know, for no reason whatsoever. We could earn a way to heaven, you know, which then gets to the point if. You know, if you're out there and you want to know how to get to heaven, then, then you know, I'll express now, you know, the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. To get to heaven, all you have to do is believe on him. And people say, well, that's too simple. You know, it's easy believers and they even call it. But that's how it is. You know, God didn't make hard believism. God didn't make it complicated. You know, unfortunately, man has made religiosity so that we have to go through hoops and do somersaults 
and tricks to and earn God's favour to get in heaven. But morals and the truth. All we have to do to get to heaven is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus himself says, oftentimes, you know, in, in, in the word, he says, Verily, very I say unto you, he that believeth of me hath everlasting life. You know, verily, verily, in the old English language means definitely, definitely, or most assuredly. You know, it's, this is a guarantee. If you simply believe on Jesus, what he has done for you personally, you can go to heaven. You can be at peace with God for all eternity. And it is simply just to believe that he loves you so much this day, so very much that he came out from his glory. Now, Jesus Christ just wasn't a nice man. Jesus Christ was God himself, who was manifest in the flesh. And he came to earth just for one purpose alone, and that was that he would die so that you could live. That was his whole point. You know, he didn't come and stay as a babe in a manger, then grow up and give us good advice, you know, which he did do. Parables, very good advice, very good truths, very spiritual. But that's not why he came to earth. He came to earth to die for you because he loved you. As simple as that. If you was to believe on this Jesus who loves you, knowing that he died for all your sins, that he was buried and rose again in resurrection power, you will live forever. You will be a peaceful God. And if you want to know why he done this, you know, the word says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin means to miss the mark. To get to heaven, we've got to get to there. And on our best day, you know, we get to there. You know, me, probably on my best day, we get to there. But I'm just saying generally, on our best day, we get to there. You know, we try and keep the commands, we try and behave and try and do all this. We fall short. God is holy and perfect. We're not. And unfortunately, as I just said, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, the wages of this sin is death. And that is separation from the love of God. And, and God doesn't want that. He doesn't desire that at all. That is why, knowing that we can never meet the requirements to make ourselves go to heaven or, or to have relationship or fellowship with a holy God, that Christ took our place. Christ, you know, became, the word even says Christ became sin for us. So he took all of our sins, the whole world, not just a few elect few or the nice people or people we would like to see in heaven. You know, Christ made payment at Calvary for all the sins of the whole world. And that is yours including, whether you're a believer or not. You know, Christ has made payment for your sins because he loves you. But for that, in order for that to be of any use or to avail you, you have to believe on him. You have to trust him and you have to know that he'd done this for you. An example I'll give, if I've got in front of me here, I'm holding my hands, two million quid, that would pay off your debts, and, and you'll be debt free for the rest of your life, All right? and I'm offering it to you, okay, it's there for the taking, and you refuse it, that is of no use whatsoever, and that's the same what Jesus does, he's made payment for your sins, but unless you receive what he has done for you in faith, just believe him because he loves you, he doesn't have to do it. He done it because he loved to do it. But unless you receive what he is offering, which is the remission of all sin, which is eternal life, which is relationship, which is everything that he has, he offers to us. Unless you receive that, it's of no use. So I would plead with you today, you know, receive what Christ has done for you. Receive what he is offering. It's totally free. The word even says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't work for it. You can't earn it. It is God's unmerited favour to you today because he loves you. So I pray that, that, that you would accept this Christ and that you would, you would become my brother or sister today. And also that all the heavens will rejoice. It says that, you know, when someone becomes a son of the living God, all the, the, the heavens rejoice in that. And, and that, that is a grand day in heaven. So, you know, please let God rejoice today. Let there be rejoicing in heaven because you've come to Christ and accepted the Saviour. And one more thing before I go, and that's, I touched on this earlier, you know, and I think it's important that people know, and it's a verse I read earlier in, in, in Philip 1.6. And it says, being confident of this very thing, okay, that he that which hath begun a good work in you 
all right, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is basically saying, in layman's terms, that if you receive Christ as Saviour today, whatever happens throughout life, you know, come what may, you're going to be guaranteed to go to heaven. Because as soon as you put your faith in Christ, Christ takes over and he will guarantee you a place in heaven with him. That is a marvellous truth and it's something that, that we can have confidence in and it is our joy in times of hardship. So I pray that you would accept Christ and you would have this same joy and same confidence that we have this very day. Just believe on Christ and live. Amen. Well, I imagine Jesus is saying right now or to about Brother Bill, well done, my good and faithful servant. Nobody could ever say it better. Uh, Brother Bill quoted two verses, uh, and but I want everybody to know that everything else he said is also in the scriptures. It's He said it in his own words, but... There's not one thing he said that we cannot find right here. But uh, he quoted Philippians and Ephesians. These are two of the uh, books that were written by the Apostle Paul. So everything he said you can find in the Gospel of John and in the letters of Paul. So if you will read those, the letters written by the Apostle Paul and the Gospel written by John, you'll see in the Word of God itself that every claim that Brother Bill just made is right there in the Scriptures. So I hope you'll do that. Um, I want to thank Brother Eric and Brother Bill for joining me today. And uh, thank you for watching. And I hope you'll join me every Wednesday and Sunday uh, for another episode uh, at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So we'll see you next time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.